Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie, and in honor of Doctor Who doing Robin Hood this week, I wanted to do my top 10 favorite fictional and historical characters from the show. I tried to limit myself on the pool of people that I pick from, like either people that the Doctor has actually met or full-on characters in episodes. Real quick reminder on the giveaway too, it's still running, or if you're just finding me for the first time, I'm doing a weekly Doctor Who giveaway. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video or on my review. So since there really aren't any spoilers from episode 3 in this, you guys don't have to worry about that if you haven't seen the episode. But starting with number 10, Stevie Wonder from Good Man Goes to War. The Doctor snatched Stevie Wonder to play for River's birthday and took both of them back to 1814. It's implied it was the Matt Smith Doctor, but it's hard to tell since River talks about meeting several of his faces. I think one of my favorite River birthday references though was when she talked about like the whole different birthday when there were two Doctors. I'm sure the Doctor paid Stevie a very generous fee though, but I kind of wonder which Stevie he picked. Like was it young Stevie Wonder or old Stevie Wonder? Moving on to number 9 though, Sigmund Freud from Curse of the Black Spot. This was just a name drop. Freud was one of those real life historical figures though that showed up all across Doctor Who and the expanded material just because he's such a notable figure. But a couple different versions of the Doctor have sat on his couch. And given the psychosexual nature of his work, we can only imagine what their conversations must have been like. I feel like a really good anniversary box set in the future would be like Freud's data file on the Doctor, like just as like a funny Easter egg. If any of you are real life psychology students, maybe you can confirm this, but I heard that in real life, the actual Sigmund Freud felt like people ended up twisting a lot of the things that he said in a lot of his research, meaning that what he originally intended for psychoanalysis to be ended up turning into something way, way different. But moving along, number eight, William Shakespeare from Shakespeare Code. Another really big recurring historical character from the canon. He's been part of at least four TV stories, not including Shakespeare Code, but the David Tennant episode made him a much bigger part of the plot. It's a very magic based story, so it's also a lot of fun because I'm a big fan of magic. I love the way they play with the myth of Shakespeare versus the reality. I mean, they do that with a lot of historical figures, but this time it was just hilarious. Everybody shut your big fat mouths. Just sounds so much better coming from the mouth of the bard. The episode was actually written by Gareth Roberts, who's written a whole bunch of other Doctor Who episodes. He actually wrote, I think it's episode six of series eight right now. But moving along, Houdini from Planet of the Ood. I love Donna and the Tenth Doctor, such a great buddy cop flick when those two are together. Houdini was just really used as a joke in this story. Several different Doctors mentioned meeting him and learning escape tricks, but Planet of the Ood was funny because it was a big joke on how the Doctor, one, either couldn't completely figure out Houdini's handcuff trick, or the trick was just useless because the handcuffs were too futuristic. Donna is actually one of the few companions that I can tolerate ripping on the Doctor all the time. It just feels so natural coming from her mouth. I know Clara's kind of tried to make fun of Capaldi a little bit, but it's a very different vibe. But moving on to number six, Leonardo da Vinci. He's been featured in the comics a lot, but on the show he's mostly been used in reference. The sixth Doctor did have a business card that read da Vinci, and the fourth Doctor did talk about him a lot during City of Death. A lot of you guys reference City of Death whenever I was asking you for your favorite historical character references. The other really funny thing going on with episode 3 right now, Robot Assured, is that Tom Riley played Da Vinci in Da Vinci's Demons. I'm not current with that show right now, like I don't do videos for it, but it's a cool coincidence. Crossover interactions like this are really, really common in British TV though, just because projects tend to run for shorter periods of time, and there's not the issue that you have with different networks competing for different talent. But moving on to number five, Winston Churchill and so many different things. Ian McNeese is probably one of my favorite character actors, usually when he's playing villains, but it's really hard to forget his Winston Churchill. Just another one of those real life historical figures that's so famous, he just ends up being parodied a lot. Not that I think the Doctor Who version of him was poking fun too much. I think the series six finale was the most fun use of Churchill. The episode is just so crazy in general that you kind of forget about him at a certain point, but just the idea of Churchill as the Holy Roman Emperor is so funny. I think that says a lot about what Moffat thinks that Churchill thinks about himself. Like Churchill would see himself as a Holy Roman Emperor. We're not meant to dig too deep though, but you do start to wonder how he was able to depose all the previous emperors. But the way they collapsed time in that episode was really confusing. But moving on to number four, Dracula in Son of the Dragon, the big finish story. It's a fifth Doctor story about Vlad the Impaler. The Doctor travels back to 1462, and it's more of a Vlad Dracula story than a traditional vampire story. I'm always a big fan of Dracula stories in general that just aren't straight up retellings of the Bram Stoker myth. There's actually even a new Luke Evans Dracula movie coming out that's kind of a prequel. It's like a Vlad Tepes movie. In the big finish story, he's played by James Purfoy from the following. Onto number three, Queen Nefertiti from Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. 
I love the ship that developed between her and Rupert Graves from Sherlock. So many fandoms in that episode, including Harry Potter. One of the best moments she had though was when she met Amy and asked her if she was also a queen. I feel like Amy kind of let that go to her head from thereafter. Like from thereafter, she kind of thought of herself as a little bit more of a queen in like the most adorable way. I would say that most, if not all, female companions on Doctor Who are queen material. Wouldn't it be so funny though if like on all the BBC casting sheets for potential future female companions, it said, you know, must be able to play queen. I feel like one of the reasons they chose Nefertiti in that episode was because Cleopatra had already been done so much. There are only a handful of notable ancient queens to pick from. I would say Catherine the Great is probably one of the bigger ones they haven't done yet. I do kind of wonder if they didn't use her just because the Cold War was going on during a lot of classic Who. The singer Foxes is actually going to be in Mummy on the Orient Express. She's going to be playing a singer in the episode, but everyone keep your eyes peeled for more Cleopatra references. Moving on to number two, Hitler from Let's Kill Hitler. So this episode was made after Inglorious Bastards did that crazy version of Hitler and the Hitler Downfall movie, the one with the scene of Hitler going insane. In case you missed it, it was parodied to infinity. But the funny thing that Moffat did in this episode was basically reduce Hitler to window dressing. Like he almost had a non-speaking part. I just love that they made one of the most infamous villains in modern history window dressing in a River Song story. Of course it totally makes sense that Crazy Melody Pond would show up in a Hitler episode. But finally my number one favorite historical character, Vincent Van Gogh. He's my favorite mostly because the episode Vincent and the Doctor just in general is an emotional touchstone for the Matt Smith era and for me personally but it's also because of the way it tied things back to the Doctor's future. I mean, most of the episode is spent trying to relate genius in this understandable way, like the psychology of genius and what it is about Vincent that's broken him. Part of the point I think it made was that, you know, genius isn't really supposed to make sense just because you'd have to be a genius to fully understand it or a madman in a box. But you do have two geniuses, one with the blue box and one with the brush and canvas, both completely unable to change their futures. They couldn't alter Van Gogh's timeline, and all the terrible things from the Doctor's future that we've learned about so far will probably still end up happening at some point. For example, I think the Pocket Universe solution during the 50th anniversary is just a stopgap. I think eventually the Time Lords will come out, and the Time War will start again. It's going to be really interesting to see how the show deals with that. Right now, I think the only solution to avoid you know, potential Time War is for the writers to keep Gallifrey inside the Pocket Universe. I do think Capaldi is going to find it eventually, but I don't think that they're going to rush to bring it back into normal space. I think that part of the reason they saved it in the 50th, from a production standpoint at least, was so that someday they'd be able to do Time Lord stories again, but not right away. But now it's your turn. Let me know in the comments who's your favorite fictional or historical figure on Doctor Who, and do you want to see them bring Gallifrey back, like full-on Time Lords back, before Capaldi leaves? In case you didn't see my earlier videos, he is signed on for Series 9. It's Jenna Coleman that's still undecided, or at least unannounced, if she already has made up her mind. I'm still working on my Q&A for tomorrow. Be sure to subscribe to get it. There's still plenty of time to ask questions for me to include in that. Some of you guys have actually had some really good theories about the Promised Land so far. But right now, you can click here to get that q and I'll add the annotation as soon as I post it. And you can click here to get my Episode 3 review. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow. High fives.